pray and catch up on everything that's going on here in Rio Tinto. Every Sunday, we love to welcome our first-time guests and those who are joining us for the first time today. We're really excited that you're here, and there's just a couple things we'd like to do to help connect with you a little bit better. If you look at the seat back in front of you, there's a card that has two QR codes on it. You can scan the QR code, and it will take you straight to our online form to let us know that you're visiting with us today. The other thing you can do is scan that other QR code, and it actually takes you to our e-bulletins, which we'll talk about later. Just a great way for you to get more connected with you. There's two different lobbies here in this church, and we don't really talk about them enough. Our downstairs lobby is where our welcome desk is, so if you haven't stopped by there yet, we'd really love for you to do that after the service is over. That's also the place that you can go to get your kids checked in during Sunday morning. Our upper lobby, which is down the hallway, the opposite side, is where we actually have coffee on Sunday morning to help yourself, as well as our community and events board. You can see some of our main events, things that are coming up in terms of activities and fellowship events here at the church, as well as a community board, which is a great opportunity for you to either sign up for some of those events with our physical forms, or to kind of see some of the needs and things going on here in the community and our congregation. Make sure that you check that out, and that goes for either regular attenders or our visitors here this morning. We would love for everybody to stay better connected. A few weeks ago, we kicked off our annual Baby Bottle Fundraiser for Mercy Ministries in Reading. We have one more week for you to pick up your empty baby bottles in the main lobby on the table if you haven't picked one up already. And then we would just ask that over the next two weeks that you fill those baby bottles with your loose change, dollar bills, you can put a check in there. And then we would just ask you to return those baby bottles by Sunday, February 26th. And then we'll pass those on to Mercy Ministries so they can continue their funding ministry in the city of Reading. Today, following the service, is our newcomers lunch. And we did ask for people to sign up for that specifically, but if it is your first time and you didn't get a chance to sign up for that, but you'd also like to get to know us a little bit better and get to know more about the church, we'd really love for you to attend either way. So after the service is over, make sure that you head downstairs and go through the gymnasium to the cafeteria where we'll be serving lunch. We've had some people ask when our next membership class will be. We have not scheduled it yet. At this point, we're just wanting to get an idea of how many people are interested in attending a membership class. So if you've been thinking about it or if you're just interested in knowing what it means to be a member, please let us know at the church office. You can check today's e-bulletin for our contact information and let us know if you're interested. Once we know how many people we have, we'll go ahead and schedule a class. One other thing about today is we decided to cancel our regular second and fourth Sunday activity, which is our Sunday evening service, because it's the Super Bowl and we know the Eagles are playing tonight. We wanted to make sure that those who put in a lot of time and effort to prepare their lessons didn't end up showing up to another attended meeting. So we're canceling our Sunday evening service for tonight, but we'll kick things back off like normal for the fourth Sunday of the month, which is in two weeks. We're kicking around an idea of a VBS this year. The dates would be June 19th through the 23rd, but before we can move forward with it, we need to know if we have enough volunteers to pull that off. If you've helped with VBS before, you know it takes a lot of people to make that run well. So at this point, we're just trying to gather enough information to decide if we would have enough volunteers to run the program in June or not. So if you think you might be interested, please let Becky Demko know, or you can sign up in today's e-bulletin it does not commit you to helping. It just lets us know that you're interested and lets us know whether or not we can move forward with it. So please give that some thought, give that some prayer, and just let us know in the next couple weeks if that's something you think you might be interested in helping with. This is the final week that we get to announce sign-ups for our bingo and barbecue event, which is happening next Sunday night. The sign-ups are specifically for those of you who plan on attending and letting us know what you're going to be bringing, side dish or dessert, because we would love to enjoy a good meal together here. The church is going to be providing some pulled pork, as well as some smoked chicken and some salad options as our main course. But the other part of the night is our bingo. There's going to be some prizes for anyone who wins, whether they're just kind of fun, normal bingo food for us. But either way, it's a really fun time for us to hang out. All ages are invited, and who doesn't love a good game of bingo, right? We'd really love for you to attend, so please make sure that you let us know you're going to be here so that we make sure we have enough food and bingo options ready to go. That's next Sunday night.
morning and a long one, and also to some of the familiar viewpoints that we have coming up. At this time, we invite you to stand for the reading of the word. Good morning again, everyone. Um, I don't know if you noticed, both Jen and I were both pretty stuffy doing that announcement video. Hopefully you could understand all those announcements. I think we're starting to feel a little bit better, but I'm sure there's plenty of sickness going around. It just kind of seems like it, it's that time of year. Um, but despite how we're feeling, we still get the opportunity to worship uh, because we serve a worthy and mighty God. And as we sing uh, this first song, something familiar to us, Graves into Gardens, let's try to See if we can get ourselves, even if we don't physically feel like we're um, in that garden yet, but we can praise God because we know he's brought us out of the grave and into his marvelous, glorious light in him. So let's worship together this morning. Sun's turned off, I'm sorry. any sound. Give me just a second, guys. I'm sorry. We'll just not use any of the knobs and buttons today. Let's sing this together. I search the world. I search the world.
morning. You turn morning to dancing. You get beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn grace. This, this song that we're going to do next is a, a newer song to us, but it's got lyrics in the chorus that may be familiar to you with the, with the words of amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Um, but as we sing this song, let's reflect on these words as, as we remind ourselves that, that we are broken and lost without our Savior. And because of what he's done, we can find our life, that resurrection in him alone. So let's worship together as we learn this song and sing.
saved wretched people who didn't deserve it. And that's our story. Praise Him this morning. As the men come forward for our offering this morning, please join me as we go before the Lord today. Gracious Heavenly Father, we read in the Psalms where the psalmist said he was glad when they said unto him, let us go into the house of the Lord. And Lord, we too are thankful, Lord, to be gathered together today in your house, Lord, to worship you, sing your praises, honor you, and learn from your word. And Lord, I just pray once again for your hedge of protection around this entire ministry, Lord, around the this church, its people, its buildings, its ministries, Lord, may you just continue to guide and direct for the work you want to accomplish here at this local church, Lord. And may you just keep the evil forces away that would wish to do harm here in any way. Lord, I just also want to pray for one of our own today, Lord, uh, John Brynan, as he continues his uh, ministry trip to Kenya, Lord, I just pray you'd be with him, Lord. He's serving in a difficult and even dangerous area, Lord. I just pray your hedge of protection around him and May you just work through him and his co-laborers in the construction and in the distribution of the Bibles, Lord, that you could do a mighty work through, through this effort. And Lord, we just uh, also just want to pray for some of our folks, Lord. We have a lot of, of our members, Lord, that are down with uh, physical type issues, Lord. I do pray for Tony Myers and for Sandy Stokes, Lord. Both these ladies have been in the hospital recently and now are in rehab. I just pray for your continued healing touch upon each and every one of them, Lord. We also pray for a shark diver, one of our longtime members who's going to be facing some serious heart surgery this week, Lord. May it go well. May you guide the surgeon, the Lord, and may your healing and the protective touch be upon her. And we just pray for some of our other folks, Lord, that are either recovering from recent surgeries or a number of our folks that are dealing with uh, the influenza type virus that has been going around again lately, Lord. We just pray for your healing upon each and every one. Lord, today, marks the birthday of one of our greatest presidents. We just thank you again, Lord, for godly men and women that you've used in the past to found this nation, Lord, and be 
see this nation through difficult times that they would men and women be trusting in you and believe in your word. That, Lord, the signs have changed and we're a nation that is truly going astray and turned away from you. I just pray that once again, Lord, you would just raise up leaders that would be willing to look at this world, Lord, with a, with a biblical view, Lord, and, and to deal with the, the issues of our nation in, in a righteous manner. And Lord, now I just uh, pray for Pastor Bill as he brings the word today. It's been a difficult week for him, dealing with illness and the family, and we just thank you that everyone is, is, is recovering, and just pray you be with Pastor Bill as he brings the word this morning. We thank you for the offering that we are about to take up, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, you have been bringing into to our midst, and we just pray for your guidance, Lord, to use these funds wisely for what you want to accomplish in this local church. In your precious name we pray, amen. As those containers are being passed, if you're able, please stand and join us as we sing, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer.
continue as we sing together. We will glorify. seated in the older kids, you can be dismissed. Good morning. Every time I think I know what verses we're going to go through, I get tied up in the, the study, but man, what a, what a joy it is to study God's Word. It's amazing how you learn something completely new truly every time you dive in, if, if you dive in. Um, it's like, man, have I read this before? So let's pray and we'll get back into uh, Philippians 3. Dear Lord, again, I thank you for the opportunity to gather together, Lord, that we still live in a country where we're uh, free to do that. Lord, I pray for those that gather together uh, today under the fear of persecution God, I thank you for the fact that they get to live a life of proving their faith. Lord, I pray for strength and resolve for them. And Lord, I pray for the enemies we have here in America of comfort and leisure, the many things that also take our hearts from you. Lord, I pray that I would exegete your word properly here today. And God, again, I pray anything of me would be immediately forgotten. Um, Lord, I pray that your truth would change our lives forever. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so again, I'll, I'll give a, a quick recap of Philippians 3, uh, verses 1 through 9, because we're in 10 today. I was hoping to be done with 10 and 11, but that's not going to happen. Partly, as I, uh, as I study for especially a section that, that does touch on suffering, which this does for a minute, I, I'm telling you, every single time that we come across verses of suffering, it's like one of those weeks. Last week I talked about our family being sick, but I didn't really know sickness until this past week with our kids, because there was so much vomiting throughout the week that it was, uh, it was just one of those weeks. Um, and also, so I, I'm a little concerned that next week, because I'm going to have to bump the sufferings part to next week, so I'm concerned what this week will hold, but 
I do think it'll help the Eagles fans because they're going to lose tonight, and y'all are going to have to figure out this week on how to deal with the suffering of that. So, yeah, yeah, let's get that part out of the way. <clears throat> Let me take my jabs before we get serious. <clears throat> All right, so um, again, I, w- I want to recap just verses one through seven. Really, the main focus is that you should have absolutely no confidence in the flesh. Uh, Paul says he's glad that the confidence that he had in his religious background, his family background, whatever it may be, he's glad that it was removed. Uh, he, he did not consider that a loss, he considered it a gain to lose the confidence he had in being a Jew and a Pharisee and all those many things. And again, uh, relevance in today and while I was raised in a Christian household or I go to church or all the many things that we think contribute to us being saved instead of focusing fully on Christ is all confidence in the flesh. Paul says don't have confidence in the flesh. Then we looked at verse 8 where he really looks at the loss of all things as a benefit in comparison to the value of knowing more of Christ. Not just his religious stuff, but all things. Everything that he had gained in this life, he's willing to lose if they are stumbling blocks that keep him from growing in Christ. And then last week, we really focused on faith. What is saving faith? And the fact that it cannot just be an intellectual acceptance. That yes, of necessity, you must know the truth. You must know what the gospel is. But knowing it and believing it, saying, I agree with those statements, I believe Jesus was a historical figure, whatever it may be, without any change, is, is not saving faith, it's just belief, it's just a faith that he existed. And that if you have true saving faith, it produces fruit. And so today we're going to kind of focus on that because that's why Paul rolls right into this saving faith comes from God, but in verse 10 and 11 he talks about the efficacy of faith. What does it, how does it change him? And what does he want to know? What did the loss of those things allow him to know and continue to grow in? And so this is what Paul says in verse 10 and 11. Again, he says, I'm okay with losing all these things that I may be found in Christ and that my faith is solely in Christ. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. So again, he says, I'm happy to lose everything so that I may know Christ. And then he lists three ways in which he wishes to know Christ better. What, these are the three ways that I wish to grow in my knowledge of Christ and my life and my walk with Christ. And the things that he lists are kind of the opposite of what is listed in verses 1 through 8. The things that he used to trust, the confidence in the flesh, confidence in religion, Confidence in any outside source, anything outside of Christ. So again, he says, these things I've gotten rid of so that I may know more of the things I'm about to list. These are the three things I really want to know better in Christ. And these are the three things he says. The power of Christ's resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, and conformity to his death. And so I was hoping to get through all three of those today, but as I dove into the power of his resurrection, I couldn't get any further, so uh, I knew that we would be here up to the start of the Super Bowl if I covered all three. So we're going to cover the power of Christ's resurrection today. So again, number one, the power of Christ's resurrection. What is he talking about? What does the power of Christ's resurrection include? Well, I believe it includes an impact for both today and eternity, and so we're going to focus on three main things in Christ's resurrection, it's going to go things that impact us essentially today, things that impact us for eternity, and because of that, how, again, it in turn should impact us for today. So we're going to focus on three different aspects of Christ's resurrection. I think what happens, again, in Christianese, and the more time you spend in church or raised in church, you get used to certain phrasing that we, we don't really think of the depths of it. Resurrection is kind of one of those things. But one of the most important contingencies of resurrection is what? Death. You you have to be dead. And we've been given a very important ordinance that symbolizes this. It's called baptism. Again, the believer dies with Christ, and they are buried. The old self is dead. 
which is significant, okay? We can't just focus on, yes, now I'm coming out of the water. There is a significance there in the fact that your old self-serving self is dead. It's buried. It's supposed to be gone. There is a new self, a new creature being raised in Christ. And while you used to serve self, now your purpose is to serve Jesus Christ. And so we really should talk about how there is death as well. That we are risen and we're risen with the shackles of sin now removed. We get to serve Christ. Romans 6, 4 through 14 speaks about this in depth. And we're going to dive into it talking about the power of his resurrection while looking at death. So this is what Paul writes in Romans 6. Starting in verse 4. Therefore... We have been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be also in the likeness, we shall, certainly we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you should obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Again, emphasizing heavily the power of Christ's resurrection. When you are baptized with Christ, physically baptized, it's a representation of the spiritual effect. That you are no longer a slave to sin. Your old self was buried, was killed, is dead, is gone. And through Christ's death on the cross, you've now been raised up. And you've been raised up for a purpose, to walk in newness of life. And again, this is an important aspect. We aren't resurrected, again, spiritually speaking, through baptism. Just to feel as though now, good, we're safe from hell. That's it, we're safe from hell. That's, that's what we have gained. And again, we aren't resurrected just to be a better version of our old self. We aren't just supposed to be a more healthy, a more successful, or a happier version of the old self, which is often still preached. If you would just accept Jesus Christ, everything is going to work out for you. There is this idea, even in nuance or or. Uh, subliminal messaging, if you will, in a lot of Christian films, I find. I'm not trying to bash Christian films, but there's usually this underlying message of as soon as you accept Christ, everything from that point on starts to go well. You essentially win the lottery. Has anybody watched the movie Facing the Giants? It's kind of an old school one now. It's probably like 15, 20 years old. It just dates me. I'm not really sure what newer stuff people have come out with. But it's, I mean, it's a fine enough movie, but essentially everything is falling apart. He accepts Christ, and then he says, I'm going to serve God, and literally everything, everything changes. His football team starts to win. They win, like, the state championship. He finds a dead animal in his house that had been the smell that they've been annoyed with all the time. Somebody buys him a new truck. Like, everything works out perfect because he became a Christian, and it kind of ends with that. Like, hey, life was bad, I became a Christian, now everything's perfect. And the ultimate message that most people walk away with is, well, if life's going bad, I'll just accept Christ, and therefore I'll get a better version of the old me. I'll become a better me. And I was talking to Bob Stoltz right before this, you know, Bob was talking about some things that they've been going through physically and all that for 25 or 30 years. Tell him that life gets super simple once you become a Christian. It's just not accurate. And here's the other thing, an intellectual understanding that things may get difficult doesn't make it easy to walk through it. It doesn't. But there is a hope in Christ that allows us to get through 
these things. But the emphasis here is you're not just a better old self. That when you are baptized, when you say, I'm letting everybody know, I'm making a public profession of faith, that the old me is dead, the old you should stay dead. The old you should be dead. You're not just a better version of yourself. Again, in Romans 6, 6, he said, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. Now, here's the way that I would typically tend to read this, right? Old self is the prior former self. However, in the Greek, that's really not what is being said here. So, chronologically speaking, when you want to talk about chronology of old, you use a Greek word called archaeus. Archaeus means in it's older chronologically. However, the Greek, used, Greek word used here is palaeus. And palaeus is a word that really highlights comparative value. The old self is obsolete. It's a Greek word that's often used for when your clothing becomes worn down, it's rags that you throw away. In an American usage, it would probably be something like an expiration date. That the food is expired now, it's rotten, it's useless. You throw it away. It's not good for anything. And while we look at expiration date as the problem is that it's old, that's not actually the problem, right? The fact that the, the lettuce is old is not the problem. It's that it has rotted. Because there's other food in your pantry that's a year old that's fine to eat. But there's other stuff because it's a year old, it is not okay to eat. And I'm sure anybody that's married or has kids has found that out sometimes after you've taken a bite of something, that it was well expired. But that's the idea here. It's not just, hey, the old self, the guy I used to be is gone. No, the guy you used to be is dead. He's obsolete. He's useless. He's crucified. Again, Romans 6 is really a deep dive of what Paul is saying here in Philippians 3. If you are raised with Christ, the power of the resurrection is that the old you should be dead. And Paul emphasized that before this, that everything he used to care about, all of the things he used to pursue, his whole life's goals, the old self is gone. It's completely gone, and he is grateful for it. Before he was saved, it was impossible for him to do anything but pursue selfish ambition. But now that he got saved, he said, I'm over all those old pursuits. But unfortunately, again, what I find is many Christians, self-professing Christians, is now that I'm saved, I'm just a better version of who I used to be. But there really ought to be a 180 degree turn in just about every aspect of our lives. So Paul wants to walk in his new life given through resurrection, and not walk in the direction that he used to walk. He's saying, I'm a different man. And again, we too, who profess to know Jesus Christ, should be new creations, not simply better versions of who we used to be. And there's books in the Bible that attack this idea completely. They actually are written to local congregations that have professing Christ followers, where, however, those people go back to living the life that they used to live. They essentially say one of two things. Either I'm saved, so within Christian liberties, I can do whatever I want. Or that it's just not that big of a deal. And so Paul writes specific letters to these congregations saying, that's not okay. First John emphasizes this heavily, as well as 1 Corinthians. So again, today, as back then, we hear a lot of this, right? Don't judge people. How many people have heard that? Like, just raise your hand so I can get a drink of water. Don't judge people. I'll be honest, again, this is an attack on anybody individually, and if you can remember saying this to me, this is not an attack on you. I've probably heard that a hundred times since being here in two years. Well, I know as Christians, we're not supposed to judge anybody. Why do we believe what culture tells us a Christian is supposed to be like instead of what the Bible says a Christian is supposed to be like? Paul talks about this idea of we're not supposed to judge people, we're not supposed to inspect fruit, we're not supposed to do those things in 1 Corinthians 5 specifically. He does say this, you aren't supposed to judge non-believers. You are not supposed to judge non-believers because they have not said they were going to live up to the same standard as you. It says that very clearly in 1 Corinthians 5. Why are you attacking them? They're still lost in sin. They need to come to know Christ. When you've got this person in your congregation 
that's literally sleeping with his stepmom. And y'all are allowing him to show up every week and worship Jesus. You know he's living in overt sin, and you're totally fine with it because who are we to judge? Paul says, you better kick that dude out of your congregation. In fact, if there are individuals who claim to know Christ and continue a habitual lifestyle of sin, refuse to change, don't even eat at the same table as them. How can you know this if you don't judge their lifestyle? If you do not look at their fruit, if you do not look at the life that they're living, but instead we sit back and say, it's not on me to... Who am I to judge them? Well, you're a Christ follower. You're a brother or sister in Christ. You're supposed to inspect the fruit of other believers. They say they're supposed to live a certain way. That abhorrent behavior is supposed to be abhorrent, not encouraged, not accepted, not okay. This is what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, talking about this. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Let us, therefore, celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Again, it really helps to know some Old Testament stuff with what he's talking about here. But leaven in the Bible is a symbol of sin. It is always used as a symbol of sin. And so Paul is saying to him, listen, to the congregation of 1 Corinthians, you know this guy is sinning. His sin is poisoning the entire congregation. And it's got to be pulled out. Just a little bit of leaven will make the whole dough rise. It will mess up the whole dough. It will change it completely. And it's not just true for congregations. It's true for individuals. It grows and spreads and ruins The lump, and there is an expectation when you're saved that you're changed, that you're not okay with the leaven in your life. Again, he says, clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump just as you are, in fact, unleavened. If you are saved, you are sinless in a sense because Christ has taken it from you. In God's view, you are righteous. You have been declared righteous, so for eternity you will be forgiven but we still have this life to live. And so he says, therefore, celebrate the feast as you live your life, because the feast happens after. We'll describe that here in a minute. The feast happens after the Passover. So after you have accepted Christ, you should no longer live a life of malice and wickedness. But with unleavened bread, a sinless existence in sincerity and truth. Again, there is an expectation when you're saved that you are changed. There has always been an expectation in the Bible that when you are saved, you are changed. The Old Testament symbolizes this highly in Exodus 12 and 13. In Exodus 12, you've got the Passover. What's going on with the Passover? Well, God is telling Moses, I'm going to set the people free, but in order to be free, I'm going to kill the firstborn of everybody in Egypt, everybody in the area, all the animals, all the people all the firstborn, of anybody who doesn't have the blood of the spotless lamb to cover their family. So whoever does not have the blood of the spotless lamb will be killed. That is the Passover. Then he says, after the Passover, they are supposed to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is what it says in Exodus 13, 7. Unleavened bread shall be eaten throughout the seven days, and nothing leavened shall be seen among you nor shall any leaven be seen among you in all your borders. In fact, if they found any leaven in your house or among your people, guess what? You were immediately excommunicated from Israel. That was the old law. They found leaven in your family. They found any any bread, any of that stuff, you're gone, you're kicked out. Why? Because leaven is a representation of sin. And after the Passover, after Christ has died for you, Because the spotless lamb in Exodus was supposed to be a representation, a symbol of Jesus Christ. The spotless lamb, blood, covers your sins, keeps you from consequence. That's what the Passover lamb was, and they were supposed to celebrate it forever. That God saved those people, and he says to the Israelites, remember this in all of your generations, continue in the Passover so that you know that I saved you and you didn't save yourself. And I saved you through the blood of the lamb. And after you celebrate your salvation through the blood of the lamb, you are to celebrate with unleavened bread. 
You are to eat unleavened bread because after you are saved, you are to not sin. You are different. Isn't it interesting, too, that matzah, which is the main thing that Jewish people eat for unleavened bread, has two specific things that have to happen to matzah for it to be completed. It's striped, and then it's punctured with holes. It is fascinating the way that God has created nature, and he fits into it perfectly. And Jesus Christ was, of course, whipped and pierced for our transgressions. And because of what he did, we are considered sinless through him. Don't get caught up in that yet. You're like, wait, I'm not sinless. We'll, we'll discuss that. But these feasts were so serious back then that the father in a Jewish home is supposed to, the night before the Feast of Unleavened Bread, go through the house by candlelight and literally look in every single corner to make sure there's not even a crumb in the house. And if they found even a crumb, they would take it. They wouldn't even touch it. They would whisk it away with a, a, a quill, put it in a container, go take it out and burn it. Because that's how serious sin is supposed to be looked at. This was the symbol for Jews of what Christ had done. That you are no longer leavened bread, you are unleavened bread, you are new creatures. And again, he said to the Jews, for all of time you are to do this. You are supposed to remember these things so that you know what I, God, have done for you. And then Jesus comes along as a symbol for all those things and they have all forgotten it. Because they changed what God had said. They made it into man-made rules. They made it into a religion. They made it into all these things it wasn't supposed to be. That they earned salvation through works. They forgot who Jesus is and they crucified him. When he was always the symbol, they were always supposed to remember that. But what has happened on the flip side is on the back side of Christ that he has now died, that we're on the future part of that. We also forget that we are supposed to be new creatures. We are also supposed to be unleavened bread. It, you're not just a better creature. If you have been truly saved by Jesus Christ, you are not a better version of yourself. You are a new one. You're a new person. And I'll tell you, especially if you live in your own home, hometown or if you've grown up in the same place your whole life, depending on how far you went down into depravity, it's really hard to be that new person because everybody wants to remind you of the old person you used to be. And you're like, no, it's very hard to communicate to people, I'm not just a better version of that person. That person is dead. That person's dead. By the power of Jesus Christ, I am not that person anymore. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Again, when you are truly saved, you change. Everything about you changes. All right, not all changes happen at once. To be fair, but they do happen. You begin to produce fruit. In fact, you are changed in order to produce fruit. Like, I, I'm not so sure that's biblical. I'm pretty sure you can be saved and, and you may not immediately produce fruit. You may not ever produce fruit. Well, why don't I challenge anybody to find any verses that support that? Even, right, the only deathbed conversion I can possibly think of evidence for that at all in the Bible is the thief on the cross. But I've mentioned this before. Personally, outside of Jesus Christ, right, after I've spent 755 trillion years hanging out with Jesus Christ and I want to spend one second with another human being, I will hang out with the thief on the cross because I find him to be one of the coolest characters that ever existed. Because he's the only one who can say that even when God the Father turned his back on Jesus Christ, when everybody had turned their back on Jesus Christ, he stood up for him. He defended him on the cross. Even the thief who had been saved maybe an hour produced fruit. He, he admonished the other thief. How are you, how you talking about this guy? He's sinless. We're sinful. We deserve this. He recognized his own sin. This, this guy, he's the savior of the world, and you're over there saying bad stuff about him? I mean, the disciples had left. People had left him. God himself turned his back on Jesus Christ, but the thief on the cross said, I'm defending him. I'm standing up for his honor with my last couple of breaths. So I see evidence of that even there, but there are direct Bible verses that say if you are changed, if you are saved, you're supposed to produce good fruit. Ephesians 2.10, following two of the most important verses in the Bible, right? 2.8 and 9, as far as you are saved by grace through faith. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, 
which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Why were you saved? For good works. So that you can glorify God in your body after this. That you can worship him and have a real relationship with him. Romans 7, 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ that you may be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we might bear fruit for God. So what's the power of his resurrection? That the old self is dead and the new self is alive. You are a new tree and you are to produce fruit for God's glory. And the trajectory of your life should be to produce fruit for his glory. Now again, here's a quick disclaimer. Does this mean that you're going to be perfect on earth? Because you can find some congregations and denominations that will teach this. No, but you are seen as perfect through the blood of Jesus Christ. You are forgiven. You are justified. You are declared righteous for all of eternity because of Jesus Christ, but you are still in your earthly tent. So again, please do not think that I'm up here saying that once you're saved, you're supposed to be perfect. You're supposed to sin a li- sin, or live a sinless life. We'll dive into that soon as we continue in Philippians, where he talks about you should be perfect, but the Greek word really means mature. We'll talk about those things, but Are you supposed to be perfect? Yeah, you're supposed to. You're supposed to live a sinless life after you become saved because you now have the power through the Holy Spirit to do it. But we are still in our earthly tents and we still do fight with our flesh. Again, Paul talks about this much in Romans. 1 John 1 also covers these topics a lot. You cannot say in 1 John that you have no sin, right? Or you're a liar. If you say you have no sin, you're a liar. But also in 1 John, he says, as a Christ follower, you cannot go on habitually sinning. Because that's what 1 John was, John was combating against, is people saying, I'm a Christ follower and I'm sinless. And he's like, no, if you say you have no sin, you're not a Christ follower. You don't understand your condition. Also, those who say, I am a Christ follower and I'm totally cool with sinning, you also are not a Christian. That is what 1 John is written, uh, the whole thing is written about. So you may know that you are saved, 1 John 5, 13. That's why I've written these things to you in order that you may know that you are saved. Don't say I have no sin and don't say I can freely sin now that I am saved because a true Christ follower recognizes that they are a sinful being separated from God, but they are also free through the blood of Jesus Christ. They repent of sin and they produce fruit in their lives because they abide in Jesus Christ. The more you abide in Jesus Christ, the more fruit you will produce, and the less you abide in Jesus Christ, the less fruit you will produce. And you will stand before the Lord either as a tree that is bent over from the weight of fruit, or you will be one that is so dried up that it just barely is not kindling. And again, that is talked about in 1 Corinthians, I believe, 7. So it matters what you do if you are saved. The power of Christ's resurrection is that the old self is dead and I now have the power through the Holy Spirit to no longer sin, to serve the king of kings freely, which I did not have before I was saved. All I could do was be a slave to sin. Whatever form that took, it was self-serving. But once you are saved, truly saved, you are free to serve Jesus Christ. That is one benefit of the power of resurrection. You now bear fruit. What's another benefit? This is in eternity. The benefit is the hope found in Christ's resurrection for our future resurrection to eternal life. This is the hope that, again, as as me and Bob, and sorry, Bob, you know, again, don't talk to me before sermon. You're going to be an example, okay? But it's a good example, Bob. It's a good example. How do you get through years and years of struggle? Years and years of health issues. How do you wake up day in and day out and deal with these things? Because you know that this is just a passing life. That your hope is not in this life. It is in Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, but just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. 
Romans 8.32. We read this before, and it's just one of those verses you could probably, wow, you could probably spend your whole life, Romans 8.32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? If God was willing to crucify Jesus Christ, how will he not freely give you all things? He was willing to put out that deep of a punishment. How will he not, as a reward for you who accept him, not give you all things? Things which you have never thought about, right? Our kids, they make Christmas lists, right? And most kids make a Christmas list. And it's usually a very narrow-minded Christmas list. Typically, it's something that's like insanely expensive, where it's like, yeah, that's not an option. Like, we want, th- we each want a PlayStation 5 and a new Xbox and a new TV. No. But then there's other things where it's just this narrow, but the parents get to know their kids, they see their kids, they spend time with their kids, and on Christmas morning, they end up opening these gifts, and they're like, man, I didn't even know I wanted this. This is so much better than the thing I thought I wanted. Infinitely more so are the things that Christ has in store for us, things that we just cannot possibly imagine because of our sin. We can't imagine what heaven is going to be like. We just can't. We get glimpses. God allows us glimpses in the Bible. But he also says, listen, you, can't, you just can't fathom how amazing it's actually going to be. Revelation 22, 12 through 14, Behold, I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. There is a hope. This is not all. This world is full of suffering and struggle, but this is not all. For those who know Jesus Christ, again, this is as bad as it gets. And for those who do not know him, this is as good as it gets. Through Christ, you are guaranteed eternal life. And again, you've been given God's Holy Spirit to lead you if you truly know him. And the Holy Spirit will convict you of sin, will teach you God's word, so that you can walk in a manner worthy of a Christ follower. The Holy Spirit is our seal, that these things are guaranteed for us. Again, we looked at that deeply in Ephesians. The Greek word means a down payment. He is the promise. The Holy Spirit is our promise of better things to come. He is the down payment that we are God's forever. He has put his mark on us. No one can take us from him. That in and of itself is enough for us to attack all afflictions, all struggles in this world. And Paul writes about that. Again, we, have, we may have many momentary afflictions. And again, this world is full of pain and suffering. But our hope is founded in Christ. And if you are his, you are his forever. So what is the worst that can happen to you? Paul, again, talks about this in other places. So do some other of our authors of the New Testament. But if you grow in the power of his, erection, his resurrection... What can this world throw at you? I mean, truly, what is the worst thing that the world can do to you if you trust in Jesus Christ and you grow in your understanding and the power of his resurrection? Because Matthew 10, 28 says this, do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Don't fear what can happen to your earthly self. There is Nothing that Satan can do to you that's long-lasting. There's nothing. Now, personally, I was not ever in uh, the Navy SEALs. There's Hell Week, which many, at least men, are aware of. And Hell Week is this week of just to destroy your body, like, constantly. And the worst part is cold. I mean, for any of you all that haven't, like, dealt with true, like, true cold, where you cannot change it, and those in charge of you are not going to let you change it, when you're stuck in cold, it's, it's just the most demoralizing thing, period. And they go through this whole week, and it's not, 
You know, no matter how you talk to anybody that's ever been through Navy SEAL training, no matter how physically prepared they were, and they're the most physically fit individuals on the planet, no matter how physically fit they are, the whole week is designed to break those people. No matter how physically fit you are, you cannot get through their training without mentally being tough. And every one of them says the same thing. The only way they can make it through is they know that it's a week. It has an end. No matter how bad it gets, the clock is still ticking. No matter how cold they are, they're one second, every breath is one breath closer to being finished. They know that it is passing. There's a hope at the end of that, and no matter how hard things get, no matter what things Satan can throw at us in this life, we should not be concerned about that. We need to be concerned about he who can destroy your soul. That's God the Father. Are you right with him? We spend so much time worried about our life here and now and sickness and all those things. Are we right with God? How certain are we that we are right with God? Do we test ourselves daily to see that we are in the faith? 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58 says this. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Christ has removed the deepest fear of the entire world. It's death. Everyone in the world is terrified of actual death physical death and Christ followers have no fear of death again the manner of death sure the pain of losing loved ones absolutely death is the ramification of sin I've said this many times in a sense it is the purest form of sin it is the ultimate consequence of sin death so it hurts when a loved one passes it hurts depending on your manner of death It hurts. But death is a step that everybody's going to have to go through. Death means separation. Every human being that has ever existed is going to have to have their soul separated from their body. And those who know Jesus Christ have absolutely no fear of that. Oddly enough, and I don't believe that God speaks to me through dreams, but I had a dream last night. I'm a vivid dreamer. Like, every night, I have vivid dreams. And last night, I had this dream. It was a weird dream. I don't know. I was graduating some college thing, and I was driving. I was a passenger driving on this road, and there was a lady driving that was like a professor, and there was students in the back of this little car. And for whatever reason, we're driving down the road, and it's pitch black. And I remember driving for about five seconds, and I said to her, I mean, pitch black. Couldn't see anything. I said, you should probably turn your lights on. And... Then there was this lightning strike, and the, like, the, the, uh, the surroundings lit up, and I noticed that we were flying through the air. She had driven off the path, off a cliff, and we're driving through the air, and I see the precipice below, and the car's rotating, and there's these trees, and we're heading toward them. Everybody in the car knows they're going to die. It's this dream, and everybody knows they're going to die, and I had to write it down because this is specifically, I remember sitting there. This is my dream, right? It's a dream. But you know how you would kind of handle things in a dream because to you it's real. I heard the people in the back praying, God help us, God save us, God please. And I remember in this dream, sitting in that passenger seat, and I said to myself in a dream, man, I really hope they trusted in him before this moment instead of just at this moment. Because it was these individuals just being, they're about to, they're imminent death. And I think it was because of a conversation I had with Benaiah. He's been learning some stuff about 9-11 and talking about the jumpers that jumped instead of burning. And it's like, how do you make that decision, right? Well, it's manner of death. You're guaranteed you're going to die. You'd prefer a different manner of death. You don't want to burn. Horrible. Can't imagine, right? 
I think it's through talking through that, but I'm sitting there thinking, in a dream, calm, I mean, like, in that dream, just like, this is it. Like, there's going to be a story. I'm impaled by a tree with an upside down, in an upside down car. But the people behind me were terrified, screaming, God, please help us. God, please help us. And my only thought was, boy, I sure hope they trusted him before this. And I was, it was a dream, complete and utter peace and calm. Because if you are a Christ follower, honestly, what can Satan threaten you with? What can he take from you? He cannot take your soul. He cannot take your salvation. So specifically, the, you know the way that he attacks us Christians in everything that Paul covered in verses 1 through 9. He attacks us by goading, goading us back into confidence in the flesh. He tells us that either way we're fine on our own or... He whispers to us that we're so sinful that Christ can no longer use us. Remember your past. I can't tell you how many times Christians have said this about other Christians. Remember, yeah, but they used to be this. Like, they can't, they can't do this. They can't serve. I myself have quite the colorful past. And I've had Christians tell me, you can't do certain things because you were a terrible person before you came to know Christ. And boy, that is heart, soul-crushing. Because you're like, I thought I was a new creature. Man, that person's dead, and they're telling me that that person is alive and well. Well, don't listen to other individuals. Listen to what the Bible says. Don't listen to Satan. Yeah, you used to struggle with things, and there's wisdom that comes with those struggles. Okay, you're an alcoholic, you're a drug addict, something like that before you got saved. Don't go become a bartender. There's wisdom. But you are a new creature. Don't fear those things. Don't give them more power. Christ has already destroyed those. He has crushed them under his heel. It's gone. And if you abide in Christ, you don't need to worry about those things. But Satan wants to make sure that you don't do anything, that you do not produce fruit, and so he will convince you that you are useless or he will convince you that you should be terrified Again, he attacks us by drawing our attention towards other things that Paul counted as loss. He traps us with the absolute shimmer and shine of worldly things. He makes us useless so that we spend our lives chasing after things that we used to be attracted to because he knows while we're still in the flesh, part of us is still attracted to those things. It is very rare for an individual, though possible, Having spent two years at a rehab, I met a lot of people that changed after they came to know Christ. And I would say two individuals that I knew genuinely, the moment they got saved, that was it. Cold turkey, God removed certain temptations from them. But for most people, if you chase your whole life about power and money and riches and all that stuff and comfort, when you become saved, that will probably be a struggle for you your whole life. But as a Christ follower, we should pursue different things. And so Paul says, all these things I used to pursue that are now lost, I'm so grateful that they're gone because now that they're gone, I can so much more freely run this race. I am able to more freely know the power of his resurrection. And so I'm grateful that those things that I thought were so important and I probably wrote prayer requests out, God, please keep these things in my life. I am now grateful that he took them away from me because they were always a stumbling block. They were always something that kept me from knowing the power of his resurrection. So let us close with this type of application, okay? I've got a question. Are you walking in the power of his resurrection? Or are you just trying to be a better version of your old self? What are some practical steps you can take? Number one, have you been baptized? Baptism doesn't save you, but it is a command. If you are a Christ follower, you must be baptized. Have you taken the physical step to publicly state and symbolize what Christ has done for you? I really hope that next week we have 15 baptisms. If you say you are a Christ follower and you have not been baptized, you are in the wrong. Get baptized. Make a public statement so that everybody knows that that old self is dead and you serve Jesus Christ. Your life is about him. Do it. 
I hope we are inundated with calls and emails tomorrow with those that say they know Christ that have not been baptized so we can meet and discuss that and have a celebration next week of what Jesus Christ has done and that that old self is dead, is dead. Number two, are you reading and studying God's word to grow in the knowledge and power of Christ's resurrection? You can't grow if you don't abide in him. You can't know more if you don't study more. It doesn't just naturally happen. You have to get in God's word. It's the greatest tool that he has given us. And he has given us the Holy Spirit so that we can practically and appropriately apply that tool. Are you even in God's word so you know more about the power of his resurrection? And number three, what fruit is being produced in your life? Seriously, what did God create you to do? We read in Ephesians 2.10. We read in, uh, in Romans 7.4. God created you individually for each of your names with a purpose that only you can accomplish. You were created and determined before time that there were things that you were supposed to do. Do you even know what those things are and are you doing them? How about this? What gifts did the Holy Spirit give you in order to manifest them for God's glory? I mean, 1 Corinthians 12 especially is very clear on this, that God has given us the body of Christ and that each member has a role. How are you serving the body of Christ? How are you serving God? He has given everyone spiritual gifts. Do you even know your spiritual gift? And if you do, are you using it? Not just, oh man, God made me a great teacher, so now I'm a teacher for the school system and I make a living that way. Are you teaching others God's word? I'm not talking either natural giftedness. I'm talking gifts of the Holy Spirit. I, again, was an awful, awful student, horrible student, horrible public speaker, all those things. The fact that God has allowed me to become a pastor is, again, how ironic God can be. He works in our weaknesses, right? I cannot boast about anything. If anybody ever changes through my preaching or teaching, it is 100% God's word. It is 100% the Holy Spirit working through me because I, in and of myself, cannot do any of that. I can't. And it is amazing and awesome to sit back and say, it can't be me because I stink at all that stuff. I'm telling you, invite me to MC an actual normal thing, and you will walk out of there like, wow, he is awful. He's halfway charismatic up on the, up on the stage at church. That's because this, I'm, I'm talking about God's word. I truly believe that's what the Holy Spirit uses me to do, to preach and teach. That's it. And so once I realize that, that's what I have to do. When I don't, I'm Jeremiah. I got a fire in my bones. Do you have a fire in your bones when you're not being used by the Holy Spirit? If you don't know what God has gifted you in, then set up a time to talk with me. We'll look in the Bible at spiritual gifts, and we'll look at how you're meant to serve in Christ's body. This is not trying to fill Sunday school teachers or the rest. This is for your benefit. If you want to know the power of his resurrection, then you must serve him. There are good works that you are meant to be doing. So let's figure out what they are. And I'm not going to set you up with some internet account where you go answer some questions, and then at the end it prints out what holy spirit or what spirit spiritual gifts you have. I'm sorry, I can't stand those things. If you love those things, okay, I don't I don't like them. Let's sit, talk, discuss how God's done in your life, how he's used you, your experience. Let's dive into his word and see what your spiritual gifts are, and then use them for God's glory. Next week, we're going to look into the fellowship of his sufferings and what it means to be conformed to his death. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we spend our entire life growing in the knowledge of the power of your son's resurrection. God, there is so much just there. God, may we continually grow. May we continue to rely on your power. Lord, that our old self is dead, crucified with Christ, and we have been raised in him through your power to serve you. God, what an honor. God, may we crawl across the finish line, exhausted for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Able, we're going to respond with the wonderful cross. So let's stand and sing together.
hoping to be inundated with phone calls and emails the next couple days about individuals for baptism and also just wanting to know or have a conversation about spiritual gifts. Um, many of y'all may have already done both of those things and awesome, but for those that haven't, I hope to hear from you. And administratively, I'm going to be gone Thursday and Friday, so do it quickly. My wife has. I like Ian. No, no, Ian's a good boy back there. Of course, it's Nate. That's what we get for putting Nate on the stage. So, uh, my wife's got a milestone birthday coming up soon. She's 25, and uh, so, anyways, please uh, reach out. It's a busy week, but we'll we'll at least put something on the calendar to talk through those things. Um, we, as a local church and leaders, we just. We just want to see people live for Christ. We want to create disciples. We want to work towards making disciples who live their lives for his glory. That's what we're here for. It's the greatest honor of our lives is to help people grow closer to him. So please reach out. Let's close with this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. You are dismissed. And for the newcomers, y'all, Even if you didn't sign up, it's okay. You can come down to the lunch that we're going to meet after this.